Good morning and blessed Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. And I do want to take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of us uh, here in the sanctuary. Amen. And those of you that are listening online to, uh, to God's house. Yes, his house, his physical house, and also his sanctuary in time, his blessed and holy Sabbath day. And as usual, I share a Sabbath nugget each week that we come together. And someone may ask, well, why do you do that? Well, I do it for a couple of reasons. Recognizing that uh, many of you that are listening or tuning in, I happen to know that for a fact, have not come to the point yet where you're convinced or convicted of God's Sabbath. Maybe you've been told something else by, by others. And the second reason is that the Bible is very clear that as we come to the closing scenes of Earth's uh, history, that there would be a severe conflict between God's Sabbath and the sign of apostasy, Sunday sacredness. And so one of the reasons that I share is because I want to give all of us to remind those of us that by God's grace keep his Sabbath and honor his Sabbath and for those of you that love the Lord that have not come to that point of conviction yet hopefully that by God's grace that you will come to accept him and so today accept his Sabbath he says if you love me keep my commandments and for today's Sabbath nugget, I want to go first of all to the book of uh, Exodus chapter 31. And I'll read two verses beginning in verse 16. The Bible says, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. And then he goes on, he explains. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So the reason that God wanted them and us to keep the Sabbath, it is because it's a sign of his creatorship, his rulership in their lives, and because they belong to him. And some smart person out there might say, well, oh, that is for the Israelites. Well, my question to you this morning, is creation just for the Israelites or is it for all humanity? Besides, if you were a Christian, the Bible tells us that verily you are Israel. In the book of Galatians chapter 3 and beginning in verse 28, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be of Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. <laughs> and here's according to the promise. Who is Abraham's seed? Israel. So yes, it was written for us today. He's a God, the same God yesterday, today and forever. He wanted his people back then to observe and to keep his Sabbath. And yes, today, because we are Abraham's seed. And here's according to the promise. He wants us to do likewise. So let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for the great privilege and opportunity you have given to us to come together into your house of worship. Thank you for the blessing of your Sabbath day, your Sabbath day of rest, to which I, in which you have called us to come apart from the things of this world and to just find sweet rest in you. Yes. And yes, dear Lord, the man of sin has established a counterfeit, but the rest is still in you and in your Sabbath, and so we come. Now be with us this morning, be with your man's servant in a very special way. Speak to our hearts. 
may you give me listening ears, give us listening ears and receptive hearts. And whatsoever is said and done today, may it be done to thy name's honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake, amen. amen. And amen. amen. I want to ask us a question this morning in the form of a, a little scenario. Imagine that you were charged with the, a crime of, of, of murder and you were brought before the judge. The case has been presented to the jury and the jury comes back with a unanimous guilty verdict. The penalty, the penalty for the crime that you have committed is execution. You certainly are most deserving for the penalty because you have been found guilty. All the evidence point to the fact that yes, indeed, you have committed the crime. The jury finds you guilty. The judge now has to pass sentence and he comes in and he passes the sentence and he says, since you've been found guilty, the law says that you should be executed or be killed by lethal injection. But no sooner than he presents and he declares the verdict, he gets up from his seat. He takes off his robe. And just as the officers are about to to take you out of the courtroom, the judge steps down and he stretches out his hand and he says, let him go free. I'm going to pay the penalty. Amen. I'm going to pay the penalty for the crime that this man has committed and let him go free. What a wonderful experience that would be for you or for me because you've been set free. It would be a great exchange. The judge <laughs> has decided to take your place. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to let you know that we're all in that situation this morning because we have all committed sin and the wages of sin is death. Oh, but the judge stepped down from the universe. He stepped down from the universe and he says, Oh, let them go free. And I'm going to take the penalty. And he just didn't only say it. We would find out this morning that he actually did. My Christian friends, this morning I know that if that courtroom scene was evidence that's practical in your life, then you will go on rejoicing and to tell everybody about the goodness of this judge. My question this morning, why don't we hear much more about the judge who stepped down from the rulership, the governorship of the universe, and come and take the penalty for you and I? Why don't we hear more about that? My dear brothers and sisters, I would like to talk to us today about the great exchange, an exchange so glorious, an exchange so mighty that not even the angels, I guess if you want to make an analogy, not even the, 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 the jury, the jurors, quite understand. Oh, how could you say that? Oh yes, the Apostle Peter tells us in the book of, of First Peter. He says, of which salvation the, the prophets have inquired and, and searched diligently, First Peter chapter 1 beginning in verse 10. Who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, the grace the judge stepping down and taking your place. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow in. Other words, Peter is saying that even the prophets, 
that they were writing, they quite didn't get it. Verse 12, 1 Peter, the first chapter. Unto whom it was revealed, not unto themselves. As I said, they weren't quite clear. But unto us that they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you and the Holy Ghost set down from heaven. So Peter is saying, as he's writing now after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he has come to understand now as he studied the scriptures that, wow, this is what they were prophesying about. But even them were not quite clear about it. They did not quite understand uh, what it was all about. And then he says, which things the angels desire to look into. The great exchange. Like that case room, that uh, 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 a courtroom that I just mentioned. The angels in heaven, as they look upon what the judge has done, they, they don't understand why he has done it just like the jurors in that courtroom. They don't understand. My question to us this morning is that, do we understand the great exchange which God has given to us? Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, we all know that passage of scripture, even those that don't call themselves Christians. You know, God is amazing. God is amazing, and this is why no one would be with excuse when the judgment day comes, because everyone knows, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, the great exchange. The great exchange, my dear brothers and sisters. The Apostle Paul would tell us, he says the wages of sin is death. Remember that courtroom, condemned to death. But I want to praise God this morning that Paul did not stop there. The book of Romans chapter 6 and Verse 23, he went on to tell us about uh, the great exchange. He says, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh, yes. This morning we're talking about the great exchange. There is nothing, my dear brothers and sisters, that you and I have done could have done or will do to warrant that great exchange, that gift of eternal life when we were declared to be sinners and condemned to death. If we could have done everything, anything for it, then it would not have been the, 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 the free gift. He did it willingly. Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians, but for by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. We don't deserve it. We deserve death because we are sinners, and the wages of sin is death. Paul says it's a gift of God, not of our works, lest any man should boast. There is nothing that you and I could bring to God except the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. But I want you to know this morning that, oh yes, so many of us rejoice as we should in the, in the free gift that he has given to us by paying the price for our transgressions. But I want to ask this morning, have you thought, have you stopped to think about the price that was attached? to that gift, free to us. Oh, but it is anything but free. 
to the father and his son because he was separated from his father. Something he had never experienced because of you and I. As he was about to go to Calvary's cross, the Bible records that he gathered with his disciples to pray and he, the Bible says that we prayed and drops of blood began to protrude from his face because he now realizes what is going to happen, separation from his father. And the Bible records that he prayed three times, Father, if thou wilt, let this cup pass from me. In other words, yes, I know that we love him. I know that we agreed that I would come and pay the price, but in his humanity, he's now facing Calvary. Now coming to understand the separation that it would bring. And he says, if thou wilt, Lord, he says, let this cup, dear Father, pass from me. But then he looked down through the corridors of time and he saw you. And he saw me and he saw you, my sister, and you, my brother. And he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And he went and he paid the price, the great exchange on Calvary's cross. And in agony, he cried out. My God, oh my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Have you considered the price of that so-called free gift? My dear brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul continues to tell us in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood that he shed on Calvary's cross. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that he didn't deserve to be there. It was you and I that should have been on the cross of Calvary. But he shed his blood so that we would be redeemed, that we would be made one again with him and with his father. Peter says, the apostle Peter confirms what Paul just said in the book of First Peter again, the same first chapter, verses 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without sin and without spot. Oh yes, my dear brothers and sisters, God wants a, a sinless people. But because of our first parents uh, disobeying God and sin and all that has come into the human experience has taken over, it has never changed God's mind. It has never changed his mind from living and dwelling with a sinless people, but God realizes that this is not an ordinary task. This is the greatest job that I would ever do. Oh yes, the creation, wonderful creation. Appears like a God that came from nowhere and created everything out of nothing. Oh, that wasn't so difficult. But when it comes to returning you and I back to him, the most difficult task that he was, was faced with. It was a serious problem and it required a, a serious solution. Could he have asked one of the angels? Oh yes, he could have, but their blood would not suffice. Amen. Amen. So he had to come himself. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, whether you accept Jesus Christ 
or not. Whatever you call yourself, I want you to know this morning that sooner or later you're going to face death. Because the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I want you to know this morning that the only, the only remedy for sin is Jesus Christ. Amen. He died not only for those that came upon planet earth 2,000 years ago, and we know him as Christ that died on the cross, but he died for Adam and every other human being that has ever traversed planet earth because he is the only one that conquered death. He's the only one that paid the price that could redeem all of us from this sin, this woe of sin. My brothers and sisters, this morning, I want to let you know the great exchange that there has been nothing like it and there never ever will be anything like it in the human experience. True Christianity, my dear brothers and sisters, I said true Christianity. Salvation by God's grace through faith in his son and our savior, Jesus Christ. It's not just another belief system. It is not just uh, not a collection of uh, religious doctrines and, and dogmas. True Christianity is the reality of life. We have all the evidence in the Bible. We have the evidence of the prophecies. Only a God who knows the future could predict the future, and he predicted the future. He predicted the day as it will be, even as we are today. I shared with us last week as it was in the days of Noah. The God says that this is how it will be in the end of, uh, of the world. Amen. God prophesied thousands of years ago of the forces that would come together to fight against him and to fight against his plan of salvation. And it has all come to pass and is coming to pass just as he had prophesied. And so I want you to know uh, this morning that the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ is not just another religious a set of doctrines. It's the reality of life. Isaiah. Isaiah, who we sometimes call the gospel prophet, he wrote about 600 years before the great exchange was manifested in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, he wrote, Surely, surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, the great exchange. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Oh, what a price. What a price. You're valuable, my dear brother, my dear sister. I don't care where you are, whether you're sitting in Buckingham Palace, the White House, or you're a drug addict on the street you are valuable in the sight of God or anything else in between because my Bible tells us that he came and he made the great exchange and so Isaiah continues he says but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities Lord have mercy the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, praise God, we are healed. Rather than you and I receiving the stripes that judge took down from his seat of judgment, he took up his robe. My dear brothers and sisters, and yes, he placed the robe on us. Help me there, Father. i am decided to take the penalty for you and I. This is the reality of life. It is not just a quote-unquote Christian doctrine. 
is the doctrine of the human existence. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray, but God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The Bible continues, Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 53, I'm in verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep to the shearer was dumb, yet he opened not his mouth. My dear brothers and sisters, he paid a price, a tremendous price. John the Revelator lets us know that way before Isaiah, whom I have just quoted from Isaiah 53, and by the way, just by the way, I want to let you know this morning that primarily on account of the passage of scripture I just read, and of course the other passages, tens and thousands, if not millions, of Jewish people are defying their traditions, defying their rabbis, and are coming to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah, just as the Bible prophesied <laughs> that many of them will come to accept him as the Messiah. Yes, he is the savior of the world. The problem of the world is sin, and the only solution is not any man-made tradition, it's not any scheme that can be concocted by any man or any group of people, but the solution to the world's problems is Jesus Christ. John the Revelator tells us, looking back, way back, not only from the creation, through the times of the salvation history, coming down now to the times in which we live. And as John now looks through God's prophetic lenses to this time in which we live, he foresaw the mighty powers of earth that would come together to fight and against God's plan, God's project of the great exchange. He sees this power is solidifying so it find itself by calling all the, the nations, the political leaders of the world. We talked about that last several weeks. We see this power that is bringing together all the business enterprises of the world. This power claiming to be God on earth. This power that is bringing together all the religions, all the denominations of the earth. And John is mesmerized and he's saying, who could make war with her? Who could make war against the beast? Uh, Revelation 13 and 4. Uh, but I want to thank God this morning that God did not leave John mesmerizing and he's not going to leave you and I either. And so in John Revelation 13 and 8, the Bible tells us, about the position of those of us in these last days, what would be our lot. And he says, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, talking about the dragon himself through the beast power that is bringing all the world together to fight against God. And he says, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundations of the world. What is John saying? What he is saying is that our only hope in these times in which we live, our only hope in what is about to come upon this earth as the man of sin gather his forces. The Bible calls it mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. Again, we talked about that the last couple of weeks. The Bible is telling us that the only way for us to survive 
against this power and our amalgamation of all the forces on planet Earth is to have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life is to embrace, is to embrace the great exchange. The question is this morning, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Oh, how do I get my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Just accept the Lamb. I accept you, Jesus, as my only Savior from sin. I have faith in you that you have paid the penalty of my sin. I believe in the free gift of yourself that you have given on Calvary's cross. The only hope for humanity is the great exchange. My dear brothers and sisters, in the book of 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul tells us the first chapter and verse 9, who had saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, not because of anything we have done, but according to his own purpose, his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the word began. You know, it's amazing when we think about God. We're told in the book of Isaiah, the fourth chapter, that his ways are past finding out. In these times in which we live, we have the technology where the doctors could look at a pregnant woman and predict that that child may be born with infirmities, whether it be physical or mental. And so often, the women would choose to get rid of that child because they don't want the burden of having to take care of a child that is mentally or physically challenged, and so they get rid of the child. But God is greater than that doctor. He looked down through the corridors of time, and he saw that we're going to be disabled that we're going to be mentally and physically challenged, but nevertheless, he created us. Isn't that a wonderful God? He is a God of love. He knew of the man of sin. He knew that everyone that would stand up against him and deny him. He knew that you would deny his Sabbath. He knew, my dear brothers and sisters, that they that men and women would be cruel to each other, but nevertheless, he decided he's going to make us anyway. But then he provided a remedy. He provided a remedy. And that remedy is the great exchange, coming himself to die for us on Calvary's cross. Paul says, but God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. As he took that MRI and he saw you in your mother's womb and know you were going to be a rebel. As he saw you and he saw me know I'm going to be a drug addict for 12 and 14 years, he says, I'm going to bring him forth anyway because I have a plan for him. And if he accepts the plan, he could be exactly what I wanted him to be, perfect in my sight. My dear brothers and sisters, this morning, Paul declares to us, for he had made him to be sin for us, the great exchange, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I don't know about you, but I'm excited this morning because of the Great Exchange Project. There never has been, or will there be anything like it? And those of us that embrace it, he promises us that one day, oh yes, this is not a pie in the sky. 
It's the reality of life that we would, would live in a world that this earth will be remade with no evidence of sin and we would live in this world without pain, without suffering, without death because sin would have been eradicated. Sin has messed our minds up so terribly that when the Bible tells us of that time when uh, Jesus shall come and make all things new, so many think it's a fable. No, it's not a fable. It's a reality of life. The fact that your mind has been messed up, that you can't accept it, does not render it any more true than it is. Oh yes, it is true. We will live in a world in which there is no more sighing, no more crying, no more death, for the former things would have passed away. My dear brothers and sisters, Paul again, the Apostle Paul, and I'm quoting a lot of him, him this morning because more than any writer in the Bible, he talks about the great exchange. And so many misinterpreting Paul's writing says that oh, all we have to do is say with our lips that we accept Jesus and we're on our way to glory. But I thank God that, that the Apostle Paul in the book of of, of Romans, the third chapter, when he talks about this free gift, that we can't earn it, that we don't deserve it. And then he complete concludes, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin because grace abound? God forbid. But too many miss that passage. Because when God now paid the price for us, when Jesus hung on Calvary's cross, he did not hang the law on Calvary's cross. He paid the price for breaking the law. The law is eternal, it's everlasting. It is because men and women have been taught that the law is done away with. That's why the world is in the situation that it is in today. Contemporary society, the preachers have preached, and as I said before, someone is going to get in that pulpit tomorrow and tell the people that God's law is done away with so they don't have to keep the law. And then when the crime comes, when the murder comes, when the lying and the cheating and the things that we're seeing that are happening in the world, they now want to go to the government to ask the government to help to solve the problem. The government can't, only Jesus can. Tell the people the truth. That yes, Jesus paid the price. It was a high price. But he didn't pay the price so that you could keep on singing, sinning. Oh no, that's not why he paid the price. He paid the price because you're valuable in his sight. And he wants you to come to a point whereby you obey him. You follow his commandments and you, and you keep his laws. My dear brothers and sisters, we read in the book of Titus, it's not by our works of righteousness, we have no righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us. What love? What love? By the washing of regeneration and the re and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is not here on planet earth, but he promised his disciples 2,000 years ago, and the promise is still valid for us, that he'll send his Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who is equal in power with him. The Bible tells us that whatever Jesus tells the Holy Spirit, it's what the Holy Spirit does. Whatever the Father tells Jesus, he says, I, that's what I do. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, as God has sent his Holy Spirit to dwell with us, we're told in the book of, of John, chapter 16, that he would lead us and to guide us into all truth. Oh, yes, my dear brothers and sisters, that's in the book of John, 
chapter 16, and I think it's uh, uh, verse 13. Let me get there and give it to you directly. John chapter 16 and verse 13. Oh yes, it says, How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you the things to come. So when someone tells you, okay, I see what the word says, but the spirit told me something different, they're not talking about the Holy Spirit. They're talking about another spirit. Because the Bible says, whatever the Father says, the Son says. Whatever the Son says, the Spirit speaks. Amen. The great exchange, my dear brothers and sisters. Galatians 1, 4. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil of the world, according to the will of God and our Father. My dear brothers and sisters, this morning, God has asked me to remind some of us and to let some of us know that there is a great exchange project. And the essence of the project is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That we all are in that courtroom to receive the judgment of our acts. That we're all in that courtroom and the, the judge has pronounced judgment. Amen. But what a loving judge that he is. That he steps down from his throne. He steps down from his seat of authority. And he says, I will pay the price. Amen. The great exchange, my dear brothers and sisters. And he didn't pay the price for you to keep on sinning. He didn't pay the price. He didn't make the great exchange so that you could say that I'm living on the grace. Now I don't have to, to keep God's law. That's not what the judge says. Imagine in that little scenario that we gave, if you were listening before, when the judge says that you could go free, how wise would it be for that murderer to go out and say, well, okay, okay. The judge said that I could go free, and so he leaves the courtroom and goes out and commits more murder. How much sense does, sense does that make? Think about that when you think of, I'm living on the grace because of what Christ has done. Therefore, I don't have to keep God's law. It makes no sense. The Apostle Paul, he had taken the full advantage of the great exchange. He very early in his ministry purposed in his life that he would make that the central focus of his ministry. He had made the determination to tell men and women that of the great enterprise of the great exchange. And so he says as he wrote to the Church in Corinth, the first chapter, the first Corinthians, the second chapter. For I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. But why, Paul? Because it was supposed to be I on the cross. But he paid the price. He made the great exchange. And so this apostle Paul, because he embraced the project of the great exchange and he was beaten for it. In his labors, he was shipwrecked. He was imprisoned. He was whipped. He was rejected by many, but he continued on. Continued to tell men and women about the great exchange project. And then now he came to the end of his life He's now about to be killed. He looks through the prison cell from which he is being held and he sees a man with an ax in his hand and 
Paul knows that not too distant, that axe is going to find its resting place on his neck. He looks at the chopping block upon which his neck is, would be placed and the axeman would chop off his neck. Oh, but Paul, oh, but Paul, he embraced so deeply the great exchange project that he was able to declare in the book of, of Second uh, Timothy chapter 4, beginning in the sixth verse. He says, For I am now ready to be offered up, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I continue to believe and to preach and to teach of the great exchange. And now Paul looked forward to that day where he would experience the benefit of the sacrifices that he personally had made and so he declared henceforth because I fought a good fight I've finished my course uh, because I've kept the faith because I've embraced the great exchange project he says henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge that stepped down from his governorship of the universe and to come and live in this sinful world to come and to give us his robe of righteousness. He says that which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me, that judge that took his place, and not to me only. Paul, even in his moments before his death, always had the salvation of other men on his heart. And that's what God is looking for today, for men and women to be like Paul, to be determined to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified and to let them know that there is a hope beyond this sinful world in, in which we live. So Paul says, I'm not for me only, but unto all them also that look for his appearing. Oh yes, he's coming again. Everything that was prophesied about him has come to pass, just as it was predicted by the prophets yes. when he would be born. Where he would be born, how many years he would have his public ministry. Oh, yes, they all prophesied. Oh, yes, through David. It was prophesied that they would pull his beard, that they would gamble for his clothing. Oh yes, my dear brothers and sisters, it all has come to pass, just as the Bible predicted. God is not about to trick us when he tells us that he's going to come again. And so because of the evidence that we have in his word, that everything that has been spoken about him has been fulfilled just as it was spoken. And then, my dear brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, it will be fulfilled. The angels believed it. The ancients believed it. The apostles believed it. But if Jesus was the only evidence that I have, the only words that I have, I'll believe it anyway. Amen. And so he's saying to you this morning, let not your heart be troubled. Just as he says to his disciples about 2,000 years ago, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto my own, that where I am, you may be there also. And so Paul says that he has fought a good fight, that he's finished his course, he has kept the faith, and 
he's now looking forward to the consummation of the great escape, uh, uh, the great exchange project. My dear brothers and sisters, John the Revelator encourages us that that day should come. He says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, to him, our Savior. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. Have you made yourself ready? Have you given your life to him? And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Consummation of the great exchange. And the fine linen <laughs> is the righteousness of the saints. His robe of righteousness he has given to us. Yes, he was slain from the foundations of the world that we would live with him throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. He endured the ignominy and the pain and the suffering of agony of Calvary that we may enjoy life with him. He became mortal. He became mortal so that we may have the blessing of immortality. My dear brothers and sisters, and yes, he traded our, his righteousness for our unrighteousness, the great exchange. My dear brothers and sisters, this morning, as he was paying that price on Calvary's cross, there were two men that were on crosses next to him, one on the right and one on the left. And as Jesus was hanging there on the cross in the midst of them, one of them began to rally and to say, well, if he is the Christ, why don't he come down and save us? It's found in the book of Luke chapter 23. But one of them says, don't you know what you're talking about? He says, you and I deserve, you and I deserve what we're getting. For the wages of sin is death. But this man in the middle, he is paying the price for you and I. And he recognized Jesus to be the, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the foundation of the Great Exchange Project. And so he reaches out to Jesus and he says, Remember me when thou comest in paradise when thou comest in thy glory. And Jesus says, Verily I say unto you today, for thou shalt be with me in paradise. You have the assurance today that you would be with him in paradise. You are no different, you and I, than the thief on the cross. Oh yes, we deserve to be on the cross. But I pray this morning that everyone within the hearing of my voice would realize that he did not deserve it. It is you and I that deserve to be there, but praise God, he made the great exchange. And if we embrace it, then he promises us that one day we would be with him in glory. He wants us to be with that thief. I'm looking forward to meeting him. And he wants us to be with Paul and with Peter and all the ancients of old. Isaac and Jacob and Abraham and Noah. Oh yes, the Bible tells us that they did not live to see the promise that was made to them. We have the privilege, even though we were not living 2,000 years ago, we have the sure, uncanny, undeniable record that he did come and live and, and die and was resurrected and is sitting in the heavenly sanctuary. What is your position today with regards to the Great Exchange Project? It's a great project, and he's making an offer to you today. If you have never embraced the project, he is calling on you today to do so. 
If you have uh, embraced the project, he's calling you to be firmer and to share it with others. And so to us, he's saying from his heavenly courts, come now, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, the great exchange. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool, the great exchange. But we have to be willing, he says, and be obedient, and you shall have to eat the good of the land. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, there are a lot is going on in the world today. And if you have been listening to us, we try by God's grace Amen. to share with you the reality of what is happening. The reality is not in the evening news. Oh yes, and some of the things are real. That's not what I'm saying. They're just telling you everything that is not true. I'm just saying that they're not telling you the truth because just perhaps they don't know the truth. Amen. And the truth is the great exchange is that Jesus has paid the price Amen. for all the woes, for all the pains, the sorrows for every human being that has ever lived. Amen. And that his heart is grieved when he looks down and he sees the things that are happening in this world today with the people that he had created to serve him. And Amen. so he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and, and heavy laden, and, and I and I will give you rest. Your labor and heavy laden, he wants to exchange it for rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy, Amen. and my burden is light. He wants to make that great exchange in your life today. The question is, would you let him? If there's someone that is listening today, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. Today, if you hear his word, harden not your heart, accept him. Accept him in the quiet recesses of your heart. You don't have to go through any labors. You don't have to go on any pilgrimages. All you have to do is to say, Jesus, come into my heart. And he's just waiting. He's just waiting on the door. Today he's knocking. Open the door and let him in. Amen. And those of you that have let him in, continue to sit and to sup with him, to listen to him, to obey him, and to shine for him in a world that is rapidly, rapidly approaching its destructive destiny Jesus because of the great exchange is the only hope embrace him today father we thank you Amen. we thank you for speaking to us today even through this worthless piece of clay you are an amazing God yes. you have done amazing things and yet with all the evidence, there are those that deny you. I pray that someone that is listening today, that they would have a change of heart. That they would accept you. There is no other alternative. It's either Jesus or the world. Make your choice today. Give your heart to Jesus. Become part of the Great Exchange Project. And soon and very soon when he shall come and all things would be made new, that you would be with him to enjoy a world of peace without sin, without sorrow, yes. without death throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. I plan on being there. Yes. And somebody that I may not see, I may not know, but may have just heard this word today. Amen. I pray that maybe on that day, you might be able to walk up to me and say, Sir, I heard you preached about the great exchange and I accepted it. I don't know who that person is, but God says that his word would never 
ever return to him void. So I know that some heart has been touched today. May Jesus keep you. May he strengthen you. May he help you and give you the power and the knowledge to obey all of his commandments. May you embrace his Sabbath commandment because he says that it's a sign between him and those who claim him as, his savior, as their savior and creator. Be with us as we peruse and enjoy the rest of your holy blessed and Sabbath, the rest of your holy blessed Sabbath day. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake, amen, amen. and amen. amen.